Have anybody in the room seen this strategy or heard of this strategy or heard about Tobacco Free Ireland? About the move towards Tobacco Free Ireland? Okay, well, it's a very ambitious national strategy that aims to reduce the prevalence of tobacco use in this country to less than 5% by 2025. So obviously to do that, we're going to have to engage everybody in society. But I think over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to go give you some good reasons why you should all get involved in this and the difference, the positive benefit for everybody in the room, your families and your, your children to come. So I suppose we all know the financial or the health costs and we always associate it with health and I suppose again with health care costs. So just to look at them in a little bit more detail, these are very recent costs. They're March 2016, there was an economic assessment presented to the Department of Health and these are the costs from it. So we're talking huge costs of 506 million for the health care annually. That's a huge, huge cost. But I suppose, as I said, we all talk about the, that, we all understand that, but if we look to the private industry and look to, to productivity costs, these are sort of hidden costs in a way. You're talking about smoking breaks. Nobody likes to talk about them. At least the smokers don't like to talk about them. But they are a fact, they're part of what's happening in culture today, in every, every aspect of society. Smoking breaks are there, whether we close our eyes to them or not. And they cause a lot of animosity among smokers and non-smokers, among um, the workforce. Absence, and this follows from the previous presentation, absence from smoking-related disease and smoking um, uh, or illnesses by smokers is again a very, very high cost at 224 million. And premature death, and we all know that smokers die prematurely. Again, some more costs that you may not be, may not think of in the same way. Just going to fly through them, I suppose, really. Morbidity and mortality brings us up to 9 billion. These are huge, huge costs. And cost of fire is 6 million. And this is something we are, I suppose, looking at a lot more in recent times. Is that most fires, or a lot of fires, are caused, are started by, by smoking. And the cost of litter. If you go on to your local county council or local authority website, you will see that almost 50% of litter is tobacco-related litter. This is, and this is the same in the UK and other countries. So it's huge, huge cost to the economy. This is our money. This is the taxpayers' money. It's all of our money. So we, we do need to do something to address this. Again, I suppose there's no need to tell any of you of some of the health impacts of, of um, smoking. And we all, we all look, sorry, oh sorry, um, we all know it affects the hearts and the lungs, but did you know it affects every organ and every system in the body? Now I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you think of it in terms of the smoke that, you in, that a smoker inhales has at least 69 known cancer-causing chemicals that they breathe through the body, travels through the bloodstream and is excreted through the kidneys, through the urine. So it travels through and it is a huge, huge cost. Now, I suppose if we look at the main cancer, the main killer cancer, which is lung cancer, we're losing about 1,800 people year on year to lung cancer. And that number is growing. If we're not improving on that, that is growing. And it's growing faster in females than males. So we do need to address this. We're losing just under 6,000 people every year from tobacco-related disease and a further 92 from exposure to secondhand smoke, from illnesses related to exposure to secondhand smoke. Now, when we think back on the legislation, we think the legislation prohibits smoking in workplaces, so that was to deal with management of secondhand smoke. But we still have 92 people dying every year as a result of exposure to secondhand smoke. So, I suppose when we look at... Um, when we talk about tobacco and we look at chronic disease, the link is huge. Tobacco use is a serious contributor to chronic disease. But we, we cannot deal, we cannot reduce chronic disease without addressing tobacco. So reduction of chronic disease is a priority within the Tobacco Free Ireland um, programme. 
Now, chronic disease is something none of us in this room want to get. It really isn't something we look forward to, and it isn't something we want to get. But we can't address tobacco in isolation because it's part of who we are. We're all, it, it, um, it's part of the, the lifestyle we live. But it's one of six priority programs. The Tobacco Free Ireland program is one of six priority programs under the Healthy Ireland program. So we're also going to look at alcohol, childhood health, healthy eating, active living, health and well-being, positive health and well-being, which is what our previous speaker was talking about, and positive ageing. So we deal with all of these and they all interact. Again, if we go back from cost and focus a little bit tightly on these, I think everyone in this room will feel there is a reason to get involved in tobacco, tobacco management. And how great would it be if we could be the country that reduced our prevalence to less than 5% by 2025? That's the aim. So where are we now? Well, currently, we, this is the most recent figures we have. It's the Healthy Ireland Survey 2016. We have 19% of our population, of our adult population, are everyday smokers and a further 4% are social smokers. So that's 23% in total. But if you look on the flip side of that, it means that 77% of the population do not smoke. So 77% of your workforce don't smoke. 77% of the population are behind this move. They don't think that it's the best thing to do. If we look at the, some more facts, before I go to the highlighted one, three out of five smokers want to quit. They want to quit, but they don't know how, and they don't believe they can succeed, and they don't know how to succeed. So that's our role, is to help them to achieve that go their goal, to succeed. 18% of the population, as I said previously, is are still exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke on a daily basis. Now this is through, through work, through, through social life. Children in homes, families are exposed. That is part and parcel of what is, is out there. But I've highlighted the, the um, fact that 20% of the younger generation under 25 smoke. Now, when you ask an older smoker why they smoke, they will say, well, you know, I started when I was young and we didn't know anything about the dangers at that time. But now there is nobody under 25 or none of the under 25s that don't know some dangers of smoking. They know that's not the right thing to do, but they are still starting to smoke. So how do we address that? How do we change that cycle? Well, I don't know how familiar you all are with this picture, but as I said, Tobacco Free Ireland is under the Healthy Ireland agenda. Now, Healthy Ireland is a cross-governmental agenda. It's putting health and well-being on all of the policymakers' agenda, whether they're housing, finance, education, sport, whatever their, their, their justice, whatever their brief is, Health and well-being is on their agenda. So is tobacco management. Tobacco control is on their agenda. So that's really important that we have that backing behind us. So what's the aim of Healthy Ireland? Well, as I said, it's to put health and well-being on all agendas, policymakers' agendas, budget holders' agenda, educators' agendas, sports facilities' agendas, our agendas. If we are, we are responsible for children, we, we, it needs to be on our agendas. So the four high-level goals are to increase the, the percentage of the population that are healthy at all stages of life. And as we said earlier, chronic disease is a real issue. So, you know, because you're, you're around at 85, but if you have no quality of life, do you want to be around at 85? We want to have people healthy right through from early childhood to aging, the aging population. Reduced health inequalities, and we know that there is a much, much higher prevalence of tobacco use or smoking in lower socioeconomic groups. In one, um, one area that I have been dealing with, the re prevalence is about 56% through the population. You could have five smokers in one home. So that's very, there's a lot of exposure there for the next generation in those families. And they grow up with a culture that is very real. So when we look at why, I suppose, uh, going back to why the 20% of people that smoke, of young people that um, are still smoking, most of them would say, we know from a Eurobarometer that, that was done on the attitudes of smoking, that they smoke, they started smoking because their peers smoked. 79% of them said they started smoking because their friends smoked. 
and 21% said they started smoking because their, their parents smoked. So we have to change that cycle. So that's why I'm saying within health inequalities, when we're talking about the lower socioeconomic group, when you have five, five smokers in a home, the next generation see it as a norm, so they will start to smoke. Protecting the public from threats to health and well-being, and as I said, second-hand smoke is a threat to our health and well-being. And create an environment where every sector of the society can play its part, and that's what I'm saying to you. By embracing Tobacco-Free Ireland, you, each and every one of you, can play your part. So if we look at the sports that are out there, our, Ireland is a leader in tobacco management. We have really embraced the World Health Organization recommendations. They set out a set of six policy measures called the Empower Model, and we've embraced them very well here in Ireland, and we are seen as a leader, a world leader. Last, last October, we had um, a conference here, and we had international, um, international delegates at that conference. They're quite fascinated at some of the things we have done, the real things, not just you know, governmental things, but real, real things. But when we look at what the government has done to support us, and I talk about you know, all of the government being involved, but when you look at the big things the government have done, We've got no advertising, sponsorship or sales promotion. We have one of the highest taxes on cigarettes. We were the first country in the world to bring in the tobacco legislation prohibiting smoking in the workplace. We have pictorial warnings on our cigarettes and only last week we signed off on the plain packaging. Again, we're a leader there. The sale of tobacco is prohibited to under 18s. Um, the re we have a retail of all our tobacco um, sell sales now. We have a very successful quit campaign, which I'll talk to you about in a few moments. Prohibition on smoking in, in cars with children. And from the health service point of view, we have Im implemented tobacco-free campus policy in all our health services. And we've worked with the local county councils to Im implement it in tobacco-free playgrounds. So, now, I'm not saying it's perfect. Before anybody in the room says to me, we've seen people smoking in health services. Of course, it's not per perfect. It's a process, and it's, it's improving. But it's, we have a lot of work to do on that. But we will ha you can help us to do work on that as well. So I'm going to talk to you about that. Protecting children, as I said, is really, really important in this. With children, if you can imagine, they breathe faster than, than us. They breathe more often than us and they inhale more pollutants per pound of body weight. So the effects are greater on our children. So if you go into the accident and emergency department in any of our children's hospitals, you'll have a lot of children there that are repeated exacerbations of asthma, bronchitis, middle ear infection, wheezes, coughs, lower respiratory tract infections as a result of smoking. But we're not always addressing the smoking. We treat them with antibiotics and we treat them with other things and we let it go let them go, but we need to be more proactive than that. And as I said, the, the tobacco-free playgrounds is an initiative we've become involved in, and we now have, between Ash Ireland and the HSE, we've been very um, engaged with the county councils and local um, authorities to implement tobacco-free campus policy in the playgrounds. Now, it wasn't, it was just that they had never really thought about it. You have signs up, saying no dogs allowed, but you know, when it came to no smoking, it wasn't really an issue. And you had the best of parents from every, every social class going to the playgrounds with their children to get them some fresh air, to give them some exercise, do all the right things. And then they would take a seat at, in the park where they could watch their children, park their buggies and have a few cigarettes and throw their butts on the ground. That's normal, that's normal practice until somebody points it out to a smoker, they don't even know they're doing that. So, again, to point it out to the county council, I remember the first time we went to sell it to a county council, they, they told me, um, you know, your HSE, go back and look after your own business and don't be worrying about ours. But then when they started to think about it, and they realised that 48% of their litter was tobacco litter, they got very engaged. And they said, OK, well, we see something we can do here. Now, through ASH, we've got 80% of playgrounds all right around the country with tobacco-free campus policy. So that's, that's one little thing that has changed. And we're moving on from that, and we want to get to the 100%. We want to also extend that to the big parks. Those 
beautiful heritage parks we have, like, would say, um, Ardgillan Park or in here in, in Dublin, or lots of beautiful parks we have, you know, that the ch you bring your children there, that they wouldn't see anybody smoking there. And I was at um, an event there a couple of years back, um, a piece of work we were doing with lower socioeconomic groups, and um, um, Leo Varadkar was, was speaking, and he just made the point that he had been in a, out with his nephew at seven years old in a park the previous week, and the child had seen somebody smoke. And he says, what's he doing? What's he doing? He had never seen anybody smoke. He got to seven years of life without ever seeing anybody smoke. And I thought about that, and I thought, my God, like, I wonder how many kids get to that. And I have grandchildren myself. I have a little granddaughter of five, and she wouldn't know what it's like to see a smoker because she's privileged. She lives in a nice area of town, and her family don't smoke, or family around her. But the child in the lower socioeconomic group sees people smoking, they see it as norm. If you go into Ballymon and you ask a child there, you know, what percentage of the population smoke, they would tell you everybody smokes. That's their natural answer, everybody smokes. So this policy is for everybody, and this will change. Everybody uses our playgrounds. This will help change. We want to extend that to our beaches, to our parks, to our tater parks, to our zoo, to, you know, to family events, so that children grow up not seeing tobacco as something that is normal. Okay, so when we look at the research, you all, I know sometimes I'm using tobacco use and sometimes I'm using smoking, but that internationally it's, it's more a conversation about tobacco use. Here in Ireland it's probably more about smoking. But when we talk about tobacco and tobacco use, when you think about it, do you consider it a disease? Yes or no? It's classified as a disease by the World Health Organization. I can ask that question to doctors, a crowd of doctors, and they will tell me no. They don't think, think of it as a disease. It is a disease. It's been classified as a disease by the World Health Organization to be diagnosed and treated as any other disease. So the child that comes in with asthma is, has their asthma treated, but the parent that comes in with asthma and is a smoker has two diseases. So it's important that we think about that. So we know from research what works, what works best. And we know that, as I say, majority of smokers want to quit, but they don't believe they can quit. So what we try and do is bring, bridge those gaps, make the best treatments available through the medical card, through your health and wellbeing fund within your, your, your own organization, through occupational health, through whatever. Make it available um, to your, 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 your smokers to help them succeed. At the moment, we're watching the research around the e-cigarettes e because, as we know, there's a change towards e-cigarettes. And I'm not going to talk about it because it's, they're pretty new and it's not what we're here about today. We are watching that research and we're working with that. Any one of you that hasn't seen this man's face before? You haven't? No? Everybody else? No? Most people. He's, he's, this is Jerry Collins. He's a, um, the face behind the quit campaign, a very, very successful quit campaign that came into every home in the country um, and told everybody that you can quit and we can help. Every smoker was told, you can quit and we can help. Don't be like me. I, I'm 57 years old. I've got lung cancer and I'm not going to live. And during the course of the campaign, he died. While the campaign was live, he died. And his legacy was, that's what he wanted it to be, that he would help other smokers to quit smoking, to think about quitting, to access support, and to quit successfully. We are now at a stage where we're moving on from that campaign, and about March, April, we're going to launch another next campaign, which is about telling smokers that they can join the ever-growing fraternity out there of non-smokers, ex-smokers and get the support they need from them. So it's based on an I will survive. So it's a more positive a element to the campaign. But it's building on what we have what we've done there. So it's more really reaching out to smokers to join the ex-smokers out there. We have now more ex-smokers than smokers in, our, in the Irish society. So that's a big, big thing. Again, I spoke earlier about the researched best practice in tobacco management. So 
when we all when we started to look at it, we had face to face smoking cessation support. Now with growing media, we have all kinds of support. So smokers can never say there is no support available. If you go on to quit.ie, you get all, the full range of supports. You get the list of face-to-face -face supports. You get free phone support. You get online support. You get an app, um, a Heroes app. You get Facebook support. All of the supports are out there. And they're all based on, on um, they're all working towards the national standard, which is based on pr current international best practice. So all of those supports we can stand over. So all of your, you can, you can direct all your clients to those supports at all times, and they will find something that will work for them. So what does a, a tobacco-free environment look like? Fresh, clean, wholesome. That's what I'm hoping that picture will, will tell you. Okay, so why would you in your organization think of implementing a tobacco-free campus policy? Well, we in the HSE reach probably around 4.6 million people every year through some interaction. So we're giving them one message, that smoking is bad for you, that you can quit and we can, we can help you to quit, that it's a disease that we're going to treat when you come into hospital or when you come into our service, that we, we don't think that it is, it is okay to smoke within a hospital campus, within a healthcare setting. On our, on our property, it is not okay to smoke. It's not okay for children to see you smoke, it's not okay for people to see you smoke. You shouldn't smoke when you're there. So we want to change that whole thing, that people will stop and think, where, it's not, you know, where is it okay to smoke? Where is it not okay to smoke? It's not okay to smoke inside at work. It's not okay to smoke in the pub, but it's okay to smoke outside a hospital door. Does that make sense? So we need to change that, but we need your support to change it. We need you to give out the same message that you have to think, it's not okay to smoke. So we want to change those social norms. We want to protect the health and safety and welfare of your employees. Create a supportive environment for, for smokers to quit and engage occupational health, as I say, in the process. So the benefits for the employer, well, there really are benefits for the employer. You have a safer, better workforce. You have, less, you have greater productivity, less time wasted, I suppose, on, on smoking breaks, less people out, smokers out sick. A happier workforce because there's less acrimony between smokers and non-smokers about lost time. And what's in it for the employee? Or how do you sell this to your employee? Well, when you start to think about that, you just think 77% of the population are non-smokers and perhaps even higher percentage of your workforce are non-smokers. So it mightn't be as hard as you think. I'm under pressure for time, so I just want to show you one slide. So this is fairly clear to you, I think, anyway. So you asked me how you get involved. How would you get involved? And this is where, uh, yeah, please. The Department of Health have developed an online toolkit for you and we're just going to give you a quick brief on it so it takes you through um, in four steps really but it, it will be available from the end of March online to you to make it very very simple um, we get it there in a minute and it's very clear it's based on again on what we have been doing so it's developed the policy Communicate it, implement it, and manage it. I'm not going to go through it, but it will be quite a comprehensive policy. When you go into each of these, it will give you the tools to do it and give you the right supports. And it is a supportive policy. It's about helping the smoker to quit. We, to realize for yourself that tobacco addiction dependence is what it is. It's not just smoking. Sorry, the, just the last slide I was just going to say. But anyway, look, the last slide is really to say to you, that this is, it's not about the Department of Health, it's not about HSC, it's about each and every one of us. We've all got something to gain. And we really, if we work together, we can develop a tobacco-free society. Bring down the prevalence, have our children, like Leo Varadkar said, have our children saying, a lot later than se seven or eight, what is he doing? If they see the very occasional person smoke, it's not the norm and it's not okay. So thank you for listening and enjoy your coffee.